What's poppin' suck heads? It's me, MT, and welcome back to the Heavy Spoiler Show. This is going to be a breakdown of Blade 2, the Blade movie where both the hunter vampires and the vampire hunters become the hunted. Like, I am so excited to be breaking down this beloved bloody sequel, so let's make like Blade and just dive into this thing, shall we? But of course, like always, it would make me and Paul extremely happy if you guys left a like on this video and thought about subscribing. Doing either one of those two little things really helps out the channel. But anyways, Blade 2, here I go blading again, was written by David Goyer, returning after writing Blade 1. And he wrote it specifically with Guillermo del Toro's wonderful directorial vision in mind. A director who does an absolutely phenomenal job with this movie. Goyer actually wanted Guillermo for Blade 1 as he was a massive fan of del Toro's early filmography. In particular, del Toro's 1993 directorial debut vampire film, Kronos, as well as his 1997 film, Mimic. Del Toro only agreed to do Blade 2 under the very specific stipulation that he was allowed to make the movie even scarier than the first, as making creepy ass movies was one of his favorite things to do. As you can definitely see with the design of the Reapers of this movie, because god dang are these things certified nightmare fuel. Which is why Guillermo decided to open the movie with a scene showing just how disturbing his new creation was, with the opening shot establishing the film's primary shooting location of Prague in the Czech Republic. Most of the filming for the movie was actually done in Prague, which worked out super well for the production as they were able to take advantage of the region's incredible gothic architecture while also being able to purchase a couple of abandoned factories for a pretty damn good price. And when the movie first opens with Jared Nomak attacking one of the vampire nation's blood banks, Guillermo made sure to gross out as many people as possible by having Nomak open his head like a god dang hot dog so that Nomak could snack on some smug suckheads trying to take advantage of the homeless. Like, I truly love this opening because you can immediately see that the Blade universe has just introduced a new kind of super intense vampire, one that Guillermo del Toro says he purposely modeled after leeches, mainly because leeches are all about one specific thing, finding a blood source to feed. Because in Guillermo del Toro's opinion, at that point in popular media, vampires became too much like humans, as a lot of vampires in fiction were infused with a lot of elements like romance romance and human emotion, rather than being depicted as bloodthirsty humanoid monsters with an animalistic drive to hunt and consume. And Del Toro really liked how real life leeches did not evolve to become these super attractive beings that were obsessed with finding a mate, and how they were one track minded beings mainly focused on looking for the nearest warm blooded body to feed. So Del Toro made sure to make the Reapers as disgusting as he possibly could on the outside, as well as with their biology on the inside, as we see later during the Reaper autopsy scene. And like I alluded to in my breakdown of the first Blade movie, Morbius was actually the character that the writers of Blade 1 wanted to bring in as the main antagonist for the sequel. But unfortunately, the rights to Morbius were, of course, sitting on Sony's lap and thus could not be used by New Line Cinema. So they opted for Jared Nomak instead. After this scene, we get the intro credits, which include a flashback to Blade's birth scene that we saw at the start of Blade 1, with Blade's mother, Vanessa Brooks, making a very brief appearance. Then right after this, when Blade is introducing Whistler, we get a quick flash of what looks like a police report concerning an event that took place at 7 o'clock at a family residence in Washington, D.C., with the names Whistler, Susanna, Sarah, Becky at the top of the page. Those names are very likely Whistler's dead wife and two daughters, Susanna Whistler, Sarah Whistler, and Becky Whistler. In the first movie, we learn that all three of them died in a vampire attack, which is what prompted Whistler to start his life of vampire hunting in their name. Then the movie starts with Blade chasing down some vampires who try to hop on their red and black motorcycles to escape, with red and black of course being the favorite colors of vampires due to their associations with blood and the darkness of night. Then we get a badass display of the Daywalker's superior half-vampire genome when we see him jump from the very top of this building in order to keep those vampires from escaping, with Blade of course being completely computer-generated for this jump. After this, we see Blade using his black and red jacket 
jacket to taunt and dodge his assailants like Spanish matadors use red capes to taunt and dodge bulls. I particularly love how when Blade causes this red motorcycle to wreck, we can see a cow winking on the wall in the background to accentuate this matador bull theme. This wall is an advertisement for a brand of milk seemingly called Tasty Moo Cow, produced in the Tasty Moo Cow Creamery that served as a front for the vampires that were keeping and torturing Whistler. We can see boxes of the milk that that creamery distributes next to the vampire goons doing drugs in the following scene right before Blade murders them all to rescue his old white dad. Then when Blade and Whistler return to their hideout, Scud references Frank Miller's 1986 Batman comic The Dark Knight Returns while listening to Gorillas on My Mind by the Gorillas and Redman. Like Scud is definitely a big fan of comic books and the superhero genre in general as he can be seen wearing a Hellboy t-shirt with the BPRD logo on it later on in the film, with BPRD of course standing for the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense from the Hellboy comics. Director Guillermo del Toro was of course a big fan of the Hellboy franchise and he would prove it later on by having his very next movie after Blade 2 be Hellboy 2004, also starring Ron Perlman. And he would of course also go on to direct 2008's Hellboy 2 after making Pan's Labyrinth. Scud's name is also a possible reference to the comic book series Scud the Disposable Assassin, which is about a society in the far future that allows anyone to buy a robot assassin from a vending machine. Disposable robot assassins that self-destruct after their target has been eliminated. Scud is the name of one of these robot assassins who becomes a merc for hire after getting their own autonomy by keeping the human target they were supposed to assassinate alive in the hospital, therefore keeping his self-destruct programming at bay. If this is a case, then I think that Scud being named after Scud the Disposable Assassin is very fitting considering that all the vampires view the familiars as disposable humans. And although Scud would end up being scum, he is a scummy Scud with good taste, as Scud can be seen watching the Powerpuff Girls multiple times throughout this movie. Like when he first meets Whistler while he's chilling in the garage, and even while he was running van surveillance while the rest of his friends went partying in Satan's nightclub. We can also see some Powerpuff Girls footage playing while Scud and Whistler are building their light bomb together. The Powerpuff Girl episodes used in this movie were season 2 episode 8's Down and Dirty, season 1 episode 18's Bubble Vicious, and season 3 episode 2's The Main Event. The Down and Dirty Powerpuff Girls episode that Scud watches when he first meets Whistler is an episode where Buttercup stanks up all of Townsville with her nasty superhuman body odor when she refuses to take a bath with her sisters because baths are for sissies. Buttercup is usually the character on the screen when we see Scud watching the Powerpuff Girls show, which makes sense if you consider that later on in the movie, Blade would go on to call Scud a sissy for not wanting to help during the autopsy, possibly implying and foreshadowing that Blade himself could smell Scud's own stench from a mile away. I love how Whistler even calls him Skid when he first talks to him, further foreshadowing his shitty nature as a vampire familiar. And fun fact about Blade's headquarters in this movie, it actually used to be a factory that made missiles for the Soviets in the past. So the film crew figured why not convert this old weapons facility for missiles into a vampire weapons facility for Blade, which was a dope choice in my opinion. But that facility would soon of course be infiltrated by both Assad and Nisa, dressed in their cool vampire ninja outfits that Guillermo del Toro designed himself after being heavily inspired by the anime genre. Del Toro has always been a massive fan of of Japanese anime and has gone on record to say that the dope ass action found in anime is what very much inspired the action sequences of Blade 2. And we actually get slight hints towards Scud's allegiance to the vampires during this ninja infiltration scene. The first time is when Scud licks the blood off of his finger after Whistler busts his face with a gun. And the second time is when Scud compliments Nisa and Asad suits in a please don't shoot me we're on the same side kind of way. I mean hell, Scud probably even designed those suits for them. But Anyways, after this, Nisa and Assad bring Blade to Damaskino's headquarters at Caliban Industries, with Caliban of course being a reference to the half-human, half-monster hybrid character Caliban from William Shakespeare's play The Tempest. This makes sense as Caliban Industries was secretly making half-vampire, half-monster hybrids with Damaskino's attempts to perfect the vampire genome. The symbol on the helicopter landing pad even appears to be a double helix to foreshadow Damaskino's 
those mad science experiments. Then a little later after this, Asad introduces Blade to his new team of elite vampire warriors, the Blood Pack, which is of course a clever play on the medical blood packs used to store extracted blood. After Asad introduces Daz Crawford's Lighthammer, he quickly introduces Lighthammer's girlfriend Verlaine, a character that was originally supposed to be played by actress Tracy Lords. As Verlaine was first imagined to be the twin sister of Raquel, the female vampire from the very beginning of the first Blade film. But the character was then retooled to be played by Marit Vale Keel. And following Tony Curran's Priest, we are introduced to Snowman as played by martial arts movie legend Donnie Yen, who also served as this movie's fight choreographer. Because you know, Guillermo del Toro isn't a freaking idiot and knows a goddamn baller when he sees one. Then after this, we meet Chupa as played by actor Matthew Schulz. And fun fact about Chupa, dude's name literally means to suck in Spanish, as it is based on the Spanish word chupar. And it's a damn good thing that Chupa's a vampire, because if my name was suck and I wasn't a vampire, people would probably assume that I was some notorious freak drinking skeet on the streets to make ends meet. And finally, we meet Reinhardt, played by actor Ron Perlman, an actor who has done a number of projects with Guillermo del Toro. These two are two peas in a pod, man. With the most notable amongst those projects being, of course, as Hellboy in the first two Hellboy movies. And let me tell you, man, your boy Reinhardt is so damn cool. So cool, in fact, that he is the only character who never takes off his sunglasses throughout the entire course of the film, which is kind of nuts. When Blade and Reinhardt have their first face-off upon meeting, Reinhardt asks Blade if he can blush, which is actually a racist comment that someone in real life said to Wesley Snipes in the past. Snipes insisted that this line be included as part of Reinhardt's dialogue in order to help Blade truly despise that character. And then later on, while the Blood Pack is doing their cool, badass slow motion walk to the club, behind them, you can see a giant neon sign with the word Radu on it. Radu was actually the name of real life prince of Wallachia, Radu the Handsome, the brother of the ruler of Wallachia, Vlad the Impaler. Originally born as Vlad Dracula, Vlad the Impaler has been said to have inspired the creation of Bram Stoker's character, Count Dracula. Having the name of Vlad's brother in the background behind Nisa and this vampire team could have been this film's way of teasing the coming revelation of Nisa's own brother being the main threat of the film. That neon sign flickering red and blue is very likely symbolic of this team up of the warm-blooded daywalker with this cold-blooded blood pack. As Whistler is staring at the group through his thermal scope a few moments later, you can see that Blade's body is the only body glowing red as he is the only warm-blooded vampire among them, with the rest of the blood pack showing up as a cool blue. But anyways, the House of Pain nightclub scene that follows was actually filled with around 400 extras in this singular room. And while Guillermo del Toro was a little nervous about managing all of those people, he actually ended up truly loving the experience as all 400 of them were incredibly fun and hardworking people. However, because they were all dancing for so long, the room quickly started to smell like crazy B.O., which made the director wish the production added 400 deodorant sticks to the budget. But anyways, as the blood pack walked through the House of Pain, Blade is disgusted at all the freaky shit that all of these vampire youths are up to, like French kissing with razor blades in their mouths and mutilating their own backs for fun. But I guess that's sort of the point of a club called the House of Pain. And to underscore this pain theme, the backdrop of the stage is a giant red sun, the number one celestial object of pain for all dark denizens of the vampire nation. But actually, fun fact about red suns in Marvel Comics, they're actually one of Blade's main weaknesses, much like they are for Superman in DC Comics. Recently, in 2019's Avengers number 27, we can see Blade getting the energy drained out of him as the Avengers fly near a series of red suns in outer space. But anyways, as Priest walks through the crowd, he's disgusted because a lot of the clubbing vampires aren't pure-blooded vampires like him and his team, clearly showing how racist Damaskino squad of vampires have been brought up to be, which makes sense considering that Guillermo del Toro deliberately made Damaskinos himself to be a super racist fascist of a vampire that valued only the genetically pure of his race. Which is why Damaskinos cast his own son out as soon as his experimentations poisoned Nomax DNA. Anyways, a little later, Nisa heads upstairs to look around for Reapers, but what she doesn't find is Michael Jackson! 
Michael Jackson was originally supposed to make a quick cameo as a vampire handling a bunch of human remains, but for reasons unknown, Michael Jackson could not make it for this scene. They did end up filming that moment with another actor, but ended up scrapping that moment entirely as a deleted scene. And then, after the Reapers start attacking the club, we get this moment of Lighthammer trying to get a resurrected Reaper off of him. This particular Reaper was a combination of practical and computer-generated effects, as some of these shots of that Reaper attack were of a completely robotic Reaper. Guillermo del Toro did not like the idea of over-relying on CGI to craft his cinematic illusions, so he had the Blade 2 design team craft the upper torso of a Reaper in a moving robot with realistic skin so that audiences wouldn't have to deal with that uncanny valley feeling that came with a lot of CG from that era. And later, a little fun Doctor Strange easter egg can be seen when Blade and Nomak fight in the church. Behind Nomak, you can see what appears to be the closed golden eye of Doctor Strange's Eye of Agamotto, designed the way it used to be in the Marvel comics before the MCU's influence. Then after this church scene, we very ironically have to watch a priest die. As Priest begs for Chupa to kill him in order to prevent becoming a Reaper, Chupa mutters the words, a man without fear, before shooting his comrade, which definitely feels like a reference to Marvel's main man without fear, Daredevil. Then after Whistler finds a dying Reaper, the Blood Pack take that Reaper to be cut open and examined. But you know, not so fun fact about this scene, apparently around 30 members of the film crew got temporarily blinded from all the UV lights that they used in this scene, which is kind of nuts. While the gang gets ready for their underground assault, Blade quotes the Chinese philosopher general Sun Tzu when he tells Whistler that he intends to keep his friends close and his enemies closer. But when he does, Guillermo del Toro makes sure to symbolically place Scud right behind Blade in the frame, as Scud would prove to be Blade's enemy in disguise the whole time by the end of the film. Then the Blood Pack head to the sewers of Prague in order to attract and destroy some Reapers. But do you know what's even crazier than using a Reaper's nut juice to hunt Reapers down? Nothing! Because, you know, that's pretty freaking crazy. But did you know that all of these tunnels were actually built by hand by the set designers in Prague? And all of the tunnels they built were as long as a freaking football field. Like, that absolutely blows my mind because I would not have been able to guess that at all. Like, this feels like a real location that I could go to if I chose to live my life as a Ninja Turtle in Prague. But what I could guess was that these vampires were definitely gonna betray Blade the first chance that they got, which is a prediction that Blade makes earlier in the film that comes true when Reinhardt and Damaskino's vampire goons knock Blade out and take him back to Damaskino's lair at Caliban Industries. The interior of Damaskino's lair was actually designed by Hellboy creator and comic book artist Mike Mignola, in case, you know, you didn't already know that Del Toro was all about that Hellboy life. Comic book artist Tim Bradstreet was also heavily involved with making concept art as well. The massive clock in Damaskino's lair that can be seen when Blade first arrives at Caliban Industries is actually based on the famous astronomical clock in Prague that has been around since 1410. So I have a strong feeling that Damaskino himself is probably at least as old as that clock. And not only does this clock track the time, but it also tracks the position of the sun and the moon, which are things that a vampire very much needs to know at all times. The character of Damaskinos himself, especially his pale skin and bald head, were heavily based on the famous vampire Nosferatu from the well-known 1922 German adaptation of the Dracula tale. As Damaskinos' human familiar Conan puts Blade on a slab so that the vampires can drain him of his blood, much like what happened in the first Blade film, we can notice that Blade in this movie has a number of new tattoos than he had in the last, with Wesley Snipes revealing that Blade gets a new tattoo after he has a particularly memorable vampire hunting adventure, as each tattoo tells a story. Weird fact about Kunin though, Carl Roden, the actor who played the character, actually had all of his lines dubbed over by a British actor in post, because apparently he was using a super thick Czech accent that audiences found a little bit too much for the movie. And finally, at the very end of the film, Blade of course ties up some loose ends by killing Rush, the vampire at the very start of the film, specifically in London inside of an adult parody of Buckingham Palace called 
Effingham Palace. I can't say the F word here because YouTube doesn't like it. With Rush being played by actor Santiago Segura, who has worked with Guillermo del Toro on a number of films after this, including both Hellboy movies as well as the first Pacific Rim film. But anyways, that is it for this breakdown of Blade 2. Thank you guys so much for joining me and just listening to me talk about random Blade facts. You guys are amazing. You can follow me at Mastertainment on Twitter or YouTube or Instagram or wherever I am on the internet. But most importantly, do not forget to follow Paul and me here on Heavy Spoilers because this is where it's at. We always got some great stuff for you guys and you don't want to miss it. But yes, thanks again for watching this Marvel breakdown. I cannot wait to do the next one and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.